Welcome to Farming for Health, where Farmer Lee Jones and I talk with leaders in food, farming, and health and wellness to spread knowledge and inspire a plant-forward future, starting now. Welcome to the Farming for Health podcast. I'm Dr. Amy Sapola, Director of Pharmacy with an F here at the Chef's Garden, and I am so honored to be joined by Dr. Deanna Minnick today. Thank you so much for being here. Good to be here with you, Amy. Yes. Well, I am so excited to talk about all things color and vegetables and so much. But before we do, I'd love for you to just tell our audience a little bit about yourself um, and how you kind of uh, like came along your journey to where you are today. I give all my all the credit to my mother, who was really cutting edge with her whole path. Uh, so I was raised in the 1970s. I was uh, a young child and my mom was really into health even then. So she got us turned on to, you know, making our own food, growing our own food, doing things like that. And I was kind of rebellious towards that whole movement because I was kind of feeling like, come on, what about Wonder Bread? That's what the kids are eating at school. So I was always pushing against that. But then as I got into school, into graduate school, I began to realize, wow, there's something really powerful about food. And why don't I go and study nutrition, which I did. So I have a master's degree in human nutrition and um, metabolism. And then I also have a PhD in medical science. So I went on for the long haul to study all things health, food, food components. And then after that, I went to work at a food manufacturer just to understand that industry. And then I progressed from there into working with Dr. Jeffrey Bland at a dietary supplement company in which we did lots of education. I learned about functional medicine. I went to train to become a certified functional medicine practitioner like you. And then uh, ultimately I've been, uh, well, I've been teaching for the Institute for Functional Medicine and that's also how we connected. So I have a passion for food. I have a passion for color for connecting food, not just to the body, but also to the mind and to the art of eating that food says something about who we are. Yeah. So that's in a nutshell. (laughs) Oh my gosh. And like I told you before we started, I've admired your work for so long and I love how you bring it to be so much more. Like I think you bring everything together in such a holistic way where you're really looking at more than just like the micros and the macros, right? Like, and so much of what we hear anymore is just, it's boiled down to such simplicity where there's so much more to it. But I'd love to hear, how did you like come into that understanding? I think it was because of my graduate school training. So um, I was working with a professor who was studying carotenoids. So carotenoids are the colorful plant pigments that we see in in the environment, the reds, the oranges, the yellows. And as part of my master's thesis, I was studying lycopene. And lycopene is that red compound that we find in nature, right? It's in tomatoes, watermelon, guava. So I, I think at that time I was really tuned into, okay, what are phytochemicals? And that was in the 1990s when functional foods were being discussed. So what was happening in the food industry was people were putting, manufacturers were putting lutein and other carotenoids into foods that didn't normally contain those products in order to give them health benefits. So at that time I got really tuned into, okay, phytochemicals are functional. And then uh, of course went on to study fatty acids. So that was a little bit different but then came back around when I began working with Dr. Bland and we began doing some further testing on phytochemicals to change detoxification pathways. And I started to put it all together from a scientific perspective, but then also in parallel, I was having my own personal health journey. And my personal health journey involved my reproductive tract. I had a lot of issues with my um, just overall endometriosis, I had irritable bowel syndrome, I had other things going on. And it was that food was helpful, but it wasn't the only thing that was helping me. And I had to resort to other modalities. So I began to explore the mental emotional sphere, I began to look into color, I began painting. And I think that my own sense of creativity and bringing that out helped me with a lot of my stress. So I would say there was a twofold path going on here. It was the science track of looking at phytochemicals and what they can do in the body. 
And that started in graduate school. But then there was also this other path that I was exploring more on my personal sphere. And it wasn't related to food per se. It was related to the power of colors. And I got tuned into colors in a different way than, you know, most people may just in everyday life. You know, I started seeing people as color. I would view uh, colors as emotions. And so I started to weave those two things together, looking at food and colors, and then looking at kind of the spirit, the art of color, and bringing those together into what I would call the rainbow way of eating. And the rainbow way is not just having all of the colors every day, but it's really feeling those cololors of food when we take them in. Because food is, as you know, is so much more. You know, yeah. it's not just the nutrients, it's the nourishment that it brings. Yes. Oh my gosh, I love that so much. And so when you talk about feeling the colors, like, can you elaborate on that for people who are like, what do you mean by feel the colors? Well, there's a whole science of colors. And so uh, in one of my books, it's called The Whole Detox. In Whole Detox, I have every chapter dedicated to a color. And what I did was I just spent the time to research each color. What do we know about them? What are their effects on our psychology? I know what my experience of red is. Red to me is formidable. I get kind of... Um, you know, polarized by red, I'm thinking, oh, it's too much. But it kind of depends on the hue of red as well. It could be a deep burgundy, or it could be kind of like a candy cane apple red. So, you know, even within every color, you have some particular spectra to tap into. So as I went into the science of color, what I realized is that there is the scientific aspect of a color, and then there's also the personal experience of a color. So what I did was I connected Let's just take red since I started there. Yeah. I took red and what I found in the literature was that red is connected to reactivity. It's connected to anger, but then it's also connected to vigor, passion. And so there, there's the kind of this double-sided nature of red. And if you look at a stop sign, it's red. An ambulance is red, typically. Stop sign, you know, red evokes a response. And as I went into the scientific aspects of red-colored foods, what I found was that they many times evoke a response. Either it could be inflammatory, such as, you know, some people respond to histamines in food, or mm -hmm. they have a nightshade sensitivity like peppers and tomatoes or it can be anti-inflammatory. So we look at the berries, the cherries, we look at strawberries, which can be reactive for some people, but then also very healing for inflammation in other people. So red in the body is inflammation, right? Redness, There, there's a response there. Some of those red foods that we take in, red vegetables and red fruits may actually quell some of that inflammation. So I published a whole article on the color code, how each of those colors of food seem to correspond just, you know, kind of gently, I would say, because nature isn't in a box. So there's a lot of shared functionality, but there are mm -hmm. certain things within the body of like where these compounds migrate to, and then they have a functional role. So that's red, you know, I mean, I think every, I always ask people like, what is your favorite color? Because that just tells me so much about them and where they're at. And yeah. uh, it, it's just fun. But what is your that. favorite color? Emerald green. Oh, I love it. <laughs> well, like all the plants behind you. Emerald yes. green. A note from our sponsor. Farmer Jones Farm provides nutritious, regeneratively grown vegetables to home cooks nationwide. We seek to provide our community with vegetables grown in a way that's healthy for you and good for the planet. To learn more about Farmer Jones Farm, visit FarmerJonesFarm.com. Tell me about emerald green. What is that? Like, what does that evoke and kind of what is um, the feeling around emerald, emerald green? So emerald, well, green in general, I'll just speak mm -hmm. to green overall. There's not enough specificity in the literature to <laughs> say emerald versus lime green or grass green. But green in general um, is associated with health, healing, growth, fertility, nature. You know, we mm -hmm. live on a blue and green planet. You know, you, you zoom out into the cosmos and you can see our planet is blue and green and some brown and other colors, but still predominantly like we are a plant rich planet, you know, and I do think that, um, you know, based on what I've seen in the literature nutritionally, if mm -hmm. we look at 
green plants, what they give us would be a lot in the way of heart promoting nutrients. So things mm -hmm. like vitamin K1, which I think is like the next vitamin D, folates, which help us to bring that homocysteine down. Um, also nitrates, nitrates, when we take them in, uh, they can convert to nitric oxide, which can help to open up our blood vessels. So to me, green is the color of the heart. It's not red. <laughs> right. It's green. And, um, you know, I didn't even have an awareness of that. But when I was very young, I was like, oh, I just always love to wear green. Um, but for other people, you know, they like purple and, you know, mm -hmm. there's a certain color that they're constitutionally inclined towards. And I think that there's a psychology of it. And then I think that there is a deeper meaning of it through food. Yeah. So what about for you? What, what do you like? What's your favorite color? I like yellow. That I knew you great. were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I was sensing as I was talking with him, like, she's so yellow. And I feel like a little bit orange, like, oh. you know, like that sunset-y. You yeah. know, I get, I get a feeling of people's colors sometimes. But I Ooh. definitely had you as yellow. Um, Tell me so about yellow. <laughs> yeah, you know, yellow in the literature, and this was done in Manchester, England some time ago, where researchers gave people a color wheel with all the different colors. And then they asked them to choose their favorite color. And then they also asked them in a separate questionnaire about their mood state. So people that tended towards a healthy mood state chose this sunshine yellow color. Oh, cool. <laughs> I love that. It was kind of this uh, connection between mood and color and you know, yellow evokes happiness. I mean, look at the little mm -hmm. smiley face icon with the with the two little eyes and the mouth. It's usually a yellow face. The sun, um, you know, a sunny day, summer. It confers this feeling of optimism, warmth, cheer. You know, a radiance. Yellow is radiant. It's brilliant. And so, when I think of yellow foods, I think of foods for the digestive tract. To me, that's where we harness our inner fire, that blaze of yellow, right? So, mm -hmm. and this is where people have a lot of problem. They have <laughs> sometimes a little too much yellow, but the processed yellow. So not the beautiful squashes that you have in the background, which have prebiotic fibers and help to promote a healthy gut, but they have the, the breads and the pastas and the cakes and the cookies and the bagels and, you know, a lot of the processed brown tan yellow foods which i think mm -hmm. are very depleting they can be inflammatory they can take our fire rather than help us to radiate so some of the yellow foods that can help us to radiate would be ginger and lemons and you know even if you look at plantains pineapple and banana they are some of the highest when there was a study in which they looked at the serotonin levels of foods and serotonin is that kind of contented neurotransmitter it's the happy neurotransmitter within us, but plants also contain neurotransmitters. Bananas, plantains, and lemons, I'm sorry, not lemons, bananas, plantains, and pineapple all contain very high levels of serotonin, which is interesting because even yeah. a banana is like a smile, right? It's like right. foods just make you happy. And they also contain digestive components like a pineapple. Let's just take that for a second. Mm -hmm. A pineapple contains proteolytic enzymes. So enzymes to break down things like protein. So they're helping our digestive tract. And if we're helping our digestive tract to be happy, then we're going to be happy. <laughs> That's, I think you bring it together in such a beautiful way. And I love how it correlates to the chakras as well and the colors and how you've tied that together. Even talking about green, you know, and the heart and green is not, or I'm sorry, the heart is not red, right? And I love how you bring all of that wisdom together. Um, as far as creativity goes and ex self-expression, can you talk about that too and how you've come? I love the paintings you post online on Instagram oh. and your social. I think um, it's just beautiful to see that expression of color. But can you talk to how you kind of came into painting and that sort of expression? Oh, thank you for that question. I love this because I feel like creativity is one of those under acknowledged, undervalued aspects of health and healing. Many times people think about, oh, my diet or my physical activity or my sleep. Mm -hmm. But what about creativity? Creativity needs to be on that functional medicine matrix as well. Right. I would say we need creativity through all of it. Because if you think of 
our bodies. We're constantly creative. We're making new cells. We're creating ourselves in our everyday. And the, the entire profession of healing used to be the healing arts. Mm -hmm. You know, there's an art to medicine. There's an art to healing. It requires a lot of receptivity and experience and flow. So how did I come into creativity? It was in a moment of desperation and in, in a moment of stress and feeling unwell. I remember I was uh, finishing up my PhD. I was about 28 and I was just so stressed out, quite honestly. And I, I, I live in my head and I have lived in my head most of my life, right? So I was having health issues. I was feeling stressed. And just on a weekend, I went to the art store and I bought this big roll of paint or big roll of paper and I bought all of these paints and I just started painting for the weekend. And, you know, I didn't have anything in mind. I never took a painting class. I didn't know what I was doing, but I just painted shapes and colors. And there was something about these colors. I had red, yellow and a black outline. I remember it was like a huge amoeba and I just put it up on my wall and I just looked at it. And there was just something about it. It's like it had to come out of me. I, I felt like I had this huge, like, amoeba within me of creativity, like something that needed just to just ooze out. But, you know, I didn't think like that. You know, mm -hmm. creativity is nonverbal. It can be nonverbal. It's almost like how your body needs to express and how your emotions need to speak. And often that doesn't always require words. And so I would say that every time I got stressed, I felt like, oh, I need to paint. <laughs> <laughs> pull out my roll of paper. I get my paints. I bring it out. So I, you know, all of these health issues I had, I do believe that there was a kaleidoscopic multifactorial approach that I took in order to get well. And it was the food. It was the physical activity. It was the sleep, relaxation. It was healthy relationships. But the missing link for me and I'm not saying this for everybody, but the missing link for me was that I didn't have a good outlet for stress. And the creativity was what was the key that opened that door and allowed me to walk in. It's like, okay, now that is my, that's my conduit of expression. So often when I tell my story and I have a whole story about my reproductive tract and how that healed and, you know, it's quite remarkable. And so people say to me, one of the first things they'll say is, oh, but I'm not creative. I, I mean, I'm not an artist. I'm not creative. And I say, no, you are creative. You're creating right now. We create words. We're creating our experience. We create our homes. We create our relationships. Creativity is big and broad. So I have talked about seven creatives seven archetypal creatives, right? So just to mm -hmm. run through them quickly and you can see which one you are. Yeah. I think, I think we have all of them in us, but I think that sometimes there's one that's a little bit louder than others, you know, like they yeah. kind of get our attention. And I bet you're the first one, <laughs> <laughs> primarily because of what you do. It's the food yeah. creative, the mm -hmm. food creative. Now the food creative is um, connected to being embodied and like they love everything physical. Seeing is believing, food is their medicine, food is their art. They love making pretty plates of food. They love taking pictures of food. They love growing beautiful flowers and you know, anything of nature and food and nourishment, mm -hmm. the food creative. Is that you? Oh yeah, 100%. <laughs> I don't know what the other ones are, but yes, that that's a beautiful summary. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the food creative. Um, and then the second one is what I would call the flowing creative. And um, this is the one that was coming out strongly for me. So it's it's run by emotions. It's not run by food. It's run by flow, emotions. And it's run by, um, you know, when you feel something strongly, you just, you know, for me, it was art. For some people, it's dance. For some people, it's drama. You know, whatever that art form is, but it's emotions that are the driver. Uh, then the third one is the thinking creative. And the thinking creative really speaks to the fact that being strategic can be a form of creativity. So some people, like they go to bed at night and then they have a problem on their mind and then they wake up with a solution. Like their brain has figured out like, oh, they created the path. So, you know, for some people who feel like they're not creative, oftentimes they're the thinking creative because they don't connect the dot that thinking can also be creative. It can be creative, like mind mapping. The fourth one is the movement creative, which coincides with the heart, so the green. So these people love nature. They're the, 
I would say they're the dancers, they're, they're the people who like movement, oxygenation, circulation, and also as it relates to nature. Then you have the speaking creative. So these people love words. They love creating through prose, poetry, um, maybe singing. They're the, the, any kind of speaking or how we use our throat, you know, um, projecting out. And then there's the visual creative. That is the creative that loves graphics. They love photos. They, they're they a photographer. They are um, they have to be visual. They speak in visuals. And then the last one is the connection creative. And the connection creative, much like the flowing creative is run by emotions, the connection creative is run by awe. They're run by the spirit of mystery. And, you know, it's kind of like... Um, Awe and purpose and meaning, you know, this is kind of like the the heart of the the functional medicine matrix, right? The spiritual mm -hmm. aspects. This is more like spiritual manifestation, like where you become so overtaken by an, if you can be at a concert, like a music concert where you're like, all of a sudden you find yourself in this reverie of like, oh my gosh, like I'm connected to everything here. I'm connected to all these people. I'm connected to the music. And then that gets you to create in some way, whatever way that is. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's amazing the connection and the individuality, right? And how each person can kind of fit into these or a couple of these. That's what even number four, I'm like, ooh, that connection with nature. Like I really, of I course. feel that and the movement, but for sure, number one. And I think, you know, I always talk about with food, like there's an innate wisdom to the whole, right? It's not one singular component that really is right. what – makes a food healthy, right? And so, you know, looking at this too just reminds me like it's not one singular thing that makes us healthy or that creates health in our bodies. Like there's so much more to like a vibrant life. And I love that you bring in the terms like abundance and vibrancy. And there's something to be said for getting out of average or just feeling okay, right? And getting into kind of those higher states. And can you speak to that a little bit and how you use those terms? Wow. Uh, another one I'd like to toss into the mix is transcendence. And I was in, on a call right before this where we were talking about self-actualization. Mm -hmm. So just to describe that a little bit, you know, imagine a triangle. And I think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So people don't have to know about that. But basically, you know, at the bottom of the triangle, there are some basic needs of life that we just need to meet. So we need to be able to breathe. We need to be able to eat. We need to be able to uh, sleep and um, speak. And, you know, just on a day to day, we need to just, you know, we need some kind of living space or somewhere that we have shelter. So getting those foundational needs that's really important. We can't negate that. We need to start there and just be sure that we're, we feel safe. We feel secure. And then I think from there, we kind of move on into that more creative sphere of, okay, now I can explore my creative potential. Mm -hmm. I can move into my heart space a little bit more. And then ultimately coming into like, okay, what is my purpose? What is my meaning of life? Um, you know, those are the questions that are really juicy and philosophical and, you know, even back to food, since you are connected to a farm and the earth, you know, being in that state of taking food, which is something so physical and basic for our survival, again, back to the base of the pyramid of being human, we can also create a trajectory up with that meal. Like if we just take a meal and be in that state of gratitude, be in that state of like, wow, vibrancy, everything on this plate is nourishing me. I'm experiencing the color, I'm smelling the, the aromas, you know, really tapping into our senses, mm -hmm. and not just diving in and just going for the taste, but like really being there with the food and, and having this this sense of gratitude for all of the people that are involved. And I have done this over the years where I walk people through kind of a mindful exercise. I'm sure you've done this as well, where we go back and we go back to where that plant was in the field. We imagine the farmer, we imagine the stars, the rainbows, the sky, the, the rain, everything that was a part of that plant. And then it was picked and then it was transported and then ultimately it made it to this plate. And now we're about to connect with the bonds within that plant that have been created through nature 
and break them apart in order to harness energy. So like we become it. I mean, it's such a spiritual experience. So eating is something where we can create survival all the way to transcendence if we choose to take that path. You know, for most people, they're not even there. They're just like, okay, let me just eat. I need my energy. You know, I'm stressed. If we just take a couple of seconds and we really get into that space and like lift our thoughts, we change the vibe. Mm -hmm. That meal can be so much more. Yes. That's, I, (laughs) mindful eating is something I am so passionate about. And I love that you say eating is a spiritual experience because I really think it is. And like you said, and I've written about recently too, is like what we eat literally becomes ourselves. Like, that is what makes up our body. And so I think to think about not only the plants, but the soil, like we focus on that a lot here at the farm is, you know, what's in the soil is so alive and microbially diverse, right? And if you're taking down to time to slow down and eat and breathe and appreciate, that changes not only your, your, um, mental emotional experience of eating, but also your digestive experience. And that's something I've seen a lot just working with clients is, you know, digestion changes when you're not in that fight or flight state and eating on the run and, you know, maybe feeling even bad about what you're eating or not liking the food you're eating. Um, That's a whole different experience than really eating with your senses, all of your senses, and taking time to breathe and calm down and start to digest with your eyes before you even take a bite. So, Yeah. And I I feel like just for people to try that, you know, Mm -hmm. just on their own, and then to even bring it into a, a group setting. So one of the things I love to do if I'm eating out with a group, and this just happened recently. So we were with like 10 people. And before everybody dove in, I said, should we all set an intention? Like, let's just oh. go around and just quickly say one word. You know, I, I was raised Catholic. And so like there was this tradition of saying grace, mm-hmm. so giving some kind of thanks to the food. And there was a certain prayer that we would say. And I really like that ritual because it created a pause before the activity. Mm-hmm. So, and it felt like that almost added to the meal now that I look back. So rather than have to do a prayer or, you know, um, have somebody's tradition, I just thought, why don't we just have one word that we all share? So many times we go around and like some person will say friendship, another person will say connection, love, you know, these are common words because I do this a lot. So you <laughs> say words come up. <laughs> And I even created, I need to send you one of these. Um, I I created a card deck called Nourish Your Whole Self where, um, you know, because I've I've written a number of books and I thought, you know, food is not just heady. It needs Mm -hmm. to be like, we need to feel it. We need to like use hands. So it's a card deck of 56 cards and you leave it on your dining room table or your kitchen table, wherever you eat. And then you pick a card before you eat And that sets the stage. So it has a color rim. So the color aligns to those seven systems. So you can do that. There's a little booklet inside and it describes what that card is about. Or you can just use it. You know, it's all inspiration. It's all food and inspiration. It's nothing really nutritional. Mm -hmm. So like one of the the quotes. um, So one of them from more of like the spiritual side of it, the purple color is every meal is a miracle. And it's like a very inspirational, like sun is coming out onto a field. So it's just like that. It's not like nutrition oriented. It's more like nourishment, um, which is a counterpart to nutrition. That's so beautiful. It's funny because last night I was just online looking for card decks. Like, no lie. I was literally online looking for card decks because with my kids, we just started a couple weeks ago doing, um, talking about what they what happened good in their day or what they're thankful for that day. And it, I get so much enjoyment out of just listening to what they say. Like, and I thought, <laughs> you know, like, it's just fun for me to hear what, what they find, you know enjoyable or what they're grateful for and but then I thought you know like I'd love to take this further like how do we like what else is there like what other topics could we talk about like how do we make this um more interesting so like what timing right yeah (laughs) I can't wait to see that and I think that spiritual experience too is just incredible to think through 
sort of the abundance that is all around us that sometimes we don't even notice or appreciate. And like that meal on the table is almost like an expression of love from so many people, whether we realize it or not, like how many passionate people have contributed to that meal that's on your table, right? Absolutely. It's good to have like a carved out time to exercise that muscle of gratitude because when we express gratitude, it's almost like we get more in return. Like it it just feels like it's the operating system that we can work within that gives a great return. It gives us that abundance back. Oh, Yeah. Having the gratitude to the chef, to all of those people, even if they're not there, you know, just to mentally imagine that circuitry. And what I love about plants, the reason why I've connected so much to plants like you have Mm -hmm. is, you know, I kind of feel like plants are so intelligent and inspirational. I I feel that they are the connectors between the sun and us. They're the way that we get energy from the sun because of the plant is engaging in photosynthesis. You know, it goes through this whole I've I've even looked into this, like looking at all the different forms of chlorophyll, magnesium at the heart of that, and this transfer of energy and how the bonds are created. And then we take those in. Our mitochondria is breaking apart those bonds of colorful energy. I mean, just to think of the spiritual connection with nature. And the more that we can have these colors of plants... It's like we get different kinds of wavelengths, different. I mean, we can look at food in a very physics way, too. It's kind of like all of these different bonds and all of these molecules very excited into different color states, right? It's like, Mm -hmm. you know, nature speaks in colors. And the more that we can connect to these colors, we connect to the art of nature, the spirit of nature, and even the healthful aspects. So with your kids, one idea is for you guys to... um, to eat the rainbow and I have, and you can give it to your audience, but I have like a, uh, it's an eat the rainbow tracker. Mm-hmm. I know the Institute for Functional Medicine has one and yes. I, I created my own because I went into the different circles, but kids have used it. And so you just gamify eating the rainbow and then you can talk about, you know, what colors are difficult to eat? Like maybe you don't get enough of them or what colors are you drawn to in foods or what color is your plate? You know, yeah. I eat from a blue plate. And the reason I eat from, because uh, I got this question, because I would post a lot of my meals online and people would say, why are you eating from that blue plate? And I say, because we don't have blue foods. We have blue purple foods, but I want even the color blue into my <laughs> my eating yeah. experience. So you can have fun with your kids and, you know, just eating those colors. What are those? Maybe you wear the color, like maybe it's orange, like you're going to make an orange meal with butternut squash or pumpkin or turmeric or something. And then everybody wears orange, like you have an orange day. And then you talk about what does that color mean for you and how does it feel as yeah. well? Oh my gosh, that would be so fun. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> and that's, we, I created an Eat the Rainbow box here where we oh. like feature a, a, a vegetable from each color of the rainbow every month that's seasonal. And I love the idea of that diversity and the color and the creativity that it brings in. And I think you've been the biggest inspiration for that, to be honest, like because of how you bring together color and its importance, not only from the phytochemical perspective, but also like the emotional, spiritual, you know, component. So it's, it's all connected. Wow. I'm going to have to order that. Box. <laughs> that sounds great. Actually. Yes. Oh, thank you. Yes. We'll definitely send you one. That's I, <laughs> I'd love for you to see it. So, um, Right now, though, I'd love to hear what are you like most excited about when you're cooking a meal now? Like what sort of colors are you drawn to and what sort of vegetables this time of year do you like have on your plate? So um, I live in a rural area. And one of the reasons I was asking you before we jumped on air was, you know, just where do you distribute and where do those you know, how do you, you, you kind of describe to me the whole process. So locally, we have um, a lot of farms here as well in the Pacific Northwest. So when I go to order every week, everything is seasonal, you mm-hmm. know, because that's just what they have. So I would say the thing, oh, I know what it is. I was going to say one thing, but then another thing came to mind that I had for breakfast this morning. I got this purple green chard. Ooh. Oh my gosh. It is so pretty. 
it's it's chart no, wait a minute i think it's collard green no these are collards i also have chards separately but these are massive massive leaves oh, cool. of collard greens and okay. what I did this morning is I had halibut and then I um I I have breakfast like I have dinner. I don't typically have like a standard breakfast like most people, I think. <laughs> but I took that collard green and I just sliced it up and I put it in there with the halibut just to steam it. But I loved it and even before I began cutting it, I just held it up because just looking at that purple vein going up the the middle Mm -hmm. It's so beautiful because, you know, nature doesn't often express in purple. So when it does, it's like, oh, my gosh. So and it was such a deep sage green. It wasn't like the like a grass green. It was like a deep sage. And then with the purple, it was so beautiful. So I would say a lot. I must say a lot of the greens is what I'm excited about now. Um, I did have, uh, you know, squashes are also really big right now too but I would say I'm still more excited about the variety of different greens I am really you know for the past couple of weeks I've been doing a lot of micro greens I love Mm -hmm. micro greens and I like to diversify them like uh right now I have pea shoots I have um broccoli sprouts and then I have um I think it's alfalfa it's oh no it's a mixture of um alfalfa and, and and a different kind of a radish. Oh, it's so good. So I, I love having those even with my breakfast. I'll just put it as a garnish. Yeah, uh, I love microgreens so much. That's um, as far as the microgreens go, we actually grow 50 different types. So that's when you say you like to diversify, like, oh my is, goodness. I was just asking them this because I was like, how many do we really grow? And it was like 50 or more. <laughs> It's incredible. Yeah, it's crazy. But, you know, I think microgreens are nice. Like you said, you can put them on about anything. They add so much flavor. They're really nutrient dense. They're amazing. And they're easy to incorporate kind of year round, more or less. Um, Yes. When you do your um, collard greens, how do you like to prepare those? What's your favorite way to eat them? I've had them before as a wrap. Mm-hmm. So where I just have something in the middle, like hummus, and I'll just mm-hmm. kind of roll it and then just eat it like that, just raw. But yeah. like this morning, I, I did cut it and I steamed it with the halibut and softened it a little bit because they tend to be so thick and hearty that mm-hmm. <laughs> sometimes I just want it a little softer. <laughs> yeah. So I would say that's typically how I have them. But do you oh. have a secret of like a good way to make it uh, where I, I have heard it? No, I love that. I love collard greens. I grew them myself when we lived um, in Wisconsin. And, you know, I would usually steam them. I would prepare them a lot like I would kale. Um, So I usually add like garlic or, you know, salt and pepper, a little bit of olive oil so you can get all of those nice fat soluble vitamins. And um, yeah, as a wrap though, I was over at the Culinary Vegetable Institute not too long ago and I'm like, oh, I just wrap it up. And they're like, well, steam it so that it wraps better. And I was like, oh, I guess I could. (laughs) Like, That's I don't always really take the idea. extra step, but they did say that it wraps nicer if I would steam it. That's a great <laughs> idea. I'm going to try that because you're right. Sometimes it's a little bit too um, too structured, you know, and it doesn't – but it does yeah. have a nice crunch. So, exactly. You know, Just like a nice. little nice – like a quick blanche, I guess, would work. Yeah. So, yeah. But I love I love collards. This time of year is a beautiful time for all of, like, those green, like the cruciferous vegetables. Oh. I think it's just a beautiful time. And here we've had a frost, so everything's getting sweeter, too. Like the Brussels sprouts now. Mm-hmm. This is, like, the time for Brussels sprouts. And oh, it's, neat. Yeah. It's fun to get out in the fields and kind of taste the difference. One of the – um, people I met with a long time ago was he was a farmer and an herbalist and he was saying like he tastes his field like throughout the year and tastes like the flavor variations from week to week which I always admired so much and to just appreciate like the nuances of the plants um, mm-hmm. and to have that connection I think is really cool. I, I like hearing stories about that because then it just shows me like the real dedication and love. You know, some people do it as a job and then other people do it as a passion. And I do think that there's some, there's a difference when you're eating food that was made from a passionate person versus just doing the job and just, you know, tilling the fields, planting the seeds, because that's their livelihood without the love of it. 
So that, you know, I'm sure it tastes differently to other people as well. I bet if you were to survey them, maybe that's a good research project for somebody. Oh, that'd be so cool. That's, <laughs> I've been, I say it enough that now they tease me, but um, I always say like my secret ingredient is love. And I, I tell my kids that all the time, you know. And so um, this weekend I did a tasting over at the farm market and the chef at CVI, Jamie Simpson, he gave me um, – this root vegetable mash. It was a celery root mash that I was um, mm-hmm. sampling and he wrote all the ingredients on it and the last ingredient was love. Uh. <laughs> and I was like, you got it. You heard me. I love that. So, yeah. But I do, I think there's so much to be said for that. When you think of like the meals that people make for you that taste the best, like your grandma's whatever, your mom's this or that, you know, I think more than anything, they're impossible to reproduce because of the love and care that goes into those meals. So it's so true. And, you know, there are a couple of brands that will even do that on their label and they'll put love. Mm-hmm. And I look at the naming convention of a, a food. If I'm going to buy some natural product, I'll look at what they call it because we take in everything about a food product, everything. Yeah. So that's why, that's why I choose to buy from these local farmers because I do want to support them. And I just mm-hmm. I feel that they're different. Like those collard greens that I get from those farmers – are a lot different than from my mainstream grocer. Yeah. Like, which are smaller leaves, not as like sage green and purple and beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, you just sense. I mean, even aesthetically, like through the eyes, you can see a difference. Yes. And I think, oh, go ahead. No, you. Yeah. I I was just going to say, I think that vibrancy is transferred too, like to the person. When you speak of vibrancy and energy and how – how recently something has been harvested and then consumed, like that transfer of energy. One of my favorite herbalists um, is Kate Clearlight, and she, I, I took a course with her about flowers, and she talked about when you mm. ingest flowers, like flowers get to have a human experience. And to me, I was like, oh my gosh, like that's incredible. And so I think about plants that way too, like ingesting plants, like they have more of a human experience. So probably yes, a little ethereal, but... <laughs> No, no, absolutely. <laughs> plants are our friend. Plants are what are going to help us survive on this planet. And, you know, even from a practical note, you know, I, as you know, I lecture for the institutional medicine on environmental health and, you know, all the toxins in the environment, whether heavy metals, plastics, you know, we hear about them every day. Well, the thing to protect us is plants. You know, that's what we talk about. I mean, there's so much literature to show how when people have plants in the diet, they can offset a lot of that toxic exposure because you can't do anything about the environment and what's out there. It doesn't matter if you live in a city or in the country, you're still going to be exposed. So plants are taking, they're, they're imparting to us their nutrition, which is so protective on so many levels. I bow to plants. I bow. I, I feel like I'm a guest here in this forest that I live in. I feel so honored and You know, I think the more we connect to nature, the healthier we are, you know, because we are nature. We are part of this planet. We're not separate from that plant. We are one, right? So like back to what is spirituality? Spirituality is a sense of connection and interconnection and unity. So the more that we can find that in our meals, the less we have the reactivity, the inflammation, the impulsivity, the stress. You know, it just takes us into a different mind state. Yes. I think now, especially, connection is more important than ever. So so one of the things I know um, I wanted to ask you about before we go, and I know we're running out of time, is that like the recommendations are two and a half to three cups of vegetables a day. One in 10 Americans on average are getting that. What do you think is behind that? Like what? What is making it difficult? And I know this is a complex question, but what makes it difficult? And do you have any ideas or solutions around helping people to get more vegetables in during the day? A note from our sponsor. The Chef's Garden is a family-owned regenerative farm that grows the most flavorful and nutritious vegetables, herbs, and microgreens for culinary professionals and home cooks. For over 30 years, the Chef's Garden has supplied some of the world's finest chefs and restaurants. 
Now through Farmer Jones Farm, the same delicious ingredients are available to home cooks in the United States to use and enjoy, delivered directly to their homes. The Chef's Garden mission is to grow exceptional vegetables, care for each other in the land, and to inspire a vegetable forward future. For more information, visit chefs-garden.com. During the day, well, I think, you know, preparation and planning is mm-hmm. a big part of it. Uh, so I think planning ahead, looking at what you're going to have and kind of mentally thinking about it is is essential. People think that vegetables cost more, but if you crunch the numbers, you soon see that it's not real. I mean, as long as you're eating them and they're fresh, that's mm-hmm. not really the issue either. So one of the things is making them taste better. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so bringing in things like spices can be really important for that reason. It also imparts more nutrient density when we add that to the vegetables. Um, Greater variety is also key. You know, I think people get on food jags where they're just eating the same things over and over again, and then they just kind of get bored like mentally, Mm taste-wise. So in order to like bring back that kind of that vitality for vegetables, it's like create the variety. In fact, there have been studies showing that kids will eat more vegetables when they're presented with a variety of vegetables. So in other words, if you have, I'll just take these like peas, corn, and carrots versus just having peas, they're going to eat more because just the human mind moves towards variety and like experience, which is why buffets can actually be not so good. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah. Because it could go the other way too, where, you know, if we're subject to like a whole dessert bar or a whole salad <laughs> bar with so many things, I mean, that could be our demise. So, um, but the, the right proportion of variety, and I think even for people to engage like one new vegetable every week, Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, for me recently, I, I, I bought a fennel bulb um, just to kind of like bring that in and just cut it up, taste that kind of anise kind of flavor. Mm-hmm. But I have to like really connect to it. And I think for some people, I'm not a recipe person. I'm an intuitive, like I'm in the kitchen. It's like, okay, I'm grabbing this, grabbing that, and then just putting that together. But some people need recipes. So I think even like my sister needs recipes. So like she has... Mark Hyman's, um, I got her the the food cookbook, one yeah. of his books. And so like she even has it in her kitchen um, on a stand. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like, she works well on recipes. I'm just the opposite. I don't want the recipes. So you just have to find what works for you. Are you more of a structured person? And if so, you just need to prepare and plan and have ideas for recipes and try out different things, I think. Yeah, I think so too. And I think sometimes we're scarred. I always use Brussels sprouts as the experience of like, as a child, the boiled Brussels sprouts, right? And (laughs) like, nobody likes that. And, or very few people, I imagine. But being able to re-experience, you know, what Brussels sprouts can be and, you know, having them cooked in a way that's really satisfying and delicious. And so I think, I love the intuitive cooking piece though, too. Um, I connect with that a lot. And I think sometimes (laughs) it is letting go a little bit of the recipe because sometimes that takes the fun and creativity out of it when you have to follow the recipe so I always advise like just generally I understand the idea or the concept of what you're trying to make but then also impart like your preferences and what you have on hand Um, so at least you can do some sort of combination and weave in a little bit of creativity Right. And, and, you know, a recipe is like training wheels. So I think that once a person feels more confident, like if they're not kitchen savvy Mm -hmm. and they've made something a few times, it's like, okay, now they get to play because now they have a structure in mind. They know how it tastes. I just want to tell you, Amy, my dad also has a Brussels sprout story. Oh, really? (laughs) When he was a kid. So um, he did not like Brussels sprouts. And what he would do is take off leaf by leaf and eat it because like, (laughs) And I'm like, Dad, why did you do that? You just like prolonged your misery, but he couldn't stand them. Oh, no. But like you were saying, like uh, I've had yes. such good Brussels sprouts. I think I make pretty decent Brussels sprouts, you know, just having them, you know, um, putting pine nuts, pomegranate uh, seeds. Oh, yum. I mean, oh, my gosh, there's so many good ways. Drizzling olive oil, salt and pepper. Oh, my gosh. You know, so many 
basic ways to like redo, revamp Brussels sprouts. Now my niece, my niece is eight. She is challenged by vegetables. Mm -hmm. So it's up to me, her auntie, to figure out um, (laughs) what we're going to (laughs) make. Yeah. I mean, she knows me as like the rainbow um, aunt (laughs) because it's like we we make rainbow smoothies, but you know, she doesn't like everything I make. So a, a kid is a really good test of like, trying out different things. And I've even been in schools, like with teenagers, teenagers can also be mm-hmm. a good litmus test of like, okay, how can I really, how do I, how do I get that spinach in the smoothie without them te- like knowing it's there? Yes. That's, we make uh, monster smoothies, which are green. <laughs> oh, that's a so, good one. Yeah. And my, I mean, my kids are little, so four and six, but they're, you know, monster smoothies or just also I found if we just like involve them usually if they cook it or they create it it's it's they're way more likely to eat it I used to um be an ambassador for Jamie Oliver's food revolution and I'd go out and do events with kids and one of them was building a salsa and we just had little cups and we had the kids like add in all their ingredients and mix them and the one grandma was sitting there like he'll never eat that he'll never eat that and the child proceeded to eat the entire cup and she was like I can't believe it and I was like you know he did it himself of course he's gonna try it and then he actually liked it but you know, it was cute that she was so adamant that, like, he will never, ever, ever do it while he's doing it. <laughs> he's, yeah, it's so. his creation. So, yeah, he feels some emotional connection to it. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's so true, though. And I love that with for pizzas, too, like making a rainbow pizza. Oh, with yeah. That's super fun and a That's... good way to get veggies in. Yes, I love that. And I think anytime, anytime they get to be creative and that's as someone who expresses that way, I am biased, but I think being able to be creative with kids in the kitchen and bring in that color is just so much fun. And I, you know, kids don't learn that much about cooking anymore. And so being able to cook with kids and it's a great way to teach them about like nourishment and where food comes from and all of the things. So yeah. 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 Just even a garden, like a a small windowsill type of like an Mm -hmm. herb garden thing, right? Uh, Something small. Like I sent my niece, um, it was called fairy microgreens. So it was little, it was like a fairy um, kind of a windowsill box. And then she had like, she would get to plant her microgreens and she really liked it because it was, you know, I connect her with kind of like fairies and yeah. nature in that way. And so she liked it. So, yeah, we just oh have to find it. Again, it's like, what's the key that opens the door to their interest, right? Yeah, I love the idea of your monster smoothie. I think that that's brilliant, <laughs> especially for boys, you know, yeah. got to make it cool, like the Hulk drink. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Yes. So our podcast is called Farming for Health. When you hear the term farming for health, what does that bring up for you? I get the color green. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I go right away to green and I get this image of a beautiful farm um, and kind of like the sun coming up. I mean, it's so important, you know, to start with the foundation of food mm-hmm. and as much as we can. And even if we can't feel like we can get there immediately, like just slowly bringing things in. Mm-hmm. Uh, somebody wrote me the other day about how, you know, I talk about eating the colors for health and happiness. And what the literature would suggest is that when we bring in more of these plants, we actually feel better emotionally. So when I think of, you know, farming for health, I feel like it's not just physical health, it's Mm -hmm. like whole body self health, like the mind, the emotions, and it's all connected, right? So if we're physically feeling better, we're emotionally going to have that sense of well being. I couldn't agree more. (laughs) It's it's been such a pleasure having you on the podcast. I know our listeners are going to want to connect with you. Where can they find more about you online? And if you want to tell us about your books as well, that would be amazing. Well, I think uh, to make it easy, my website has everything. It has my social channels, my books, blogs, all that kind of stuff. So it's deannaminick.com, D-E-A-N-N-A-M-I-N-I-C-H.com. And then, um, you know, I have an online group where I have people kind of come in and I run free programs at different times of the year. I typically do the whole detox program. So that's fun. You know, we talked about the colors and what I have in that book is it's basically the colors match to food, match to body systems. And so we spend three days on every color. So three times seven is 21 is a 21 day program. So, yeah, I would say that that's that's where to find me. 
Wonderful. Well, thank you so much again. This has been just wonderful. Oh, I agree. I love learning about what you're doing and I'm going to be ordering that rainbow box for sure. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Farming for Health. We hope that you enjoyed this episode. Connect with Farmerly Jones and I on Instagram and Facebook.